Autopilot's off. The captain prepares to fly the plane manually to touchdown. As they get closer to the airport... Did I hit something? Oh, no! Oh, God! The pilots can't control the plane as it cuts through a small grove. It's 6.45 p.m. Logan Air Flight 6780 cruises over the North Sea near Scotland. Take a look at that. I don't like it. There's some bad weather developing off the end of the runway. Approach. Logan 6780. Uh, there's a big storm cell on radar just off the runway. We might need to discontinue. 6780, Roger. The pilots consider their options. How much fuel do we have left? 2,500 kilos. You want to head back to Aberdeen? A nice circle. Make another attempt. As the pilots circle for another landing attempt. Oh, crap! Circuit breakers look fine. But I have control. But something's wrong. The controls feel really heavy. Radio, radio, this is Logan Air 6780. Please clear the airspace. 6780, copy. Without knowing what's wrong with the plane... Oh, it's really fighting me. It's too risky to attempt landing in a storm at Sumborough Airport. We should divert back to Aberdeen, yeah. better conditions. Agreed. Aberdeen Airport is 190 miles away. Let's try climbing to 4,000. 6780, we're going to divert back to Aberdeen. Oh, something's wrong. I can't get the plane to climb. How, how's your side? It's really heavy. And then the unthinkable happens. Oh, no! Come on! We're dropping! Ugh. Flight 6780 plunges uncontrollably towards the North Sea. The pilots wrestle with their controls as the plane speeds toward the water at 350 miles an hour. Speed! Speed! In a last-ditch effort to save the plane, the captain increases engine power. Climbing. Requesting flight level 240. 6780. Roger. Climb and maintain 240. The controls are working better now. The pilots of Logan Air Flight 6780 are on final approach to Aberdeen Airport. Aberdeen 6780, established on the localizer runway 16. Not knowing which instruments they can trust, the pilots carefully configure the plane for landing. Flaps 35. Flaps 35. Control feels normal. Having avoided disaster twice already, their sole focus is to get the plane safely on the ground. 130. Speed looks good. Decision height. Runway in sight. Continue. All right. 50 knots coming out of reverse. Check. Happy to be on solid ground. Puzzled by the crew's account of the incident on board Flight 6780, Investigators yeah. turn to the cockpit voice recorder for answers. It will answer many questions as to why things were happening the way they were and how the crew were working together and interacting together. Aberdeen Ground 6780, taxiing on Whiskey for parking stand 7. 
But something's not right. Aberdeen? Now, this is from when they landed back at Aberdeen. Right, can you stop it and go back to the top and play the game, please? Aberdeen Ground, 6780, taxiing on Whiskey for parking stand 7. That's all there is. Well, that's not going to help us very much now, is it? The CDR has recorded over the critical moments of the flight. It's a major setback for the investigation. Right, this is what we know so far. The lightning struck, the autopilot disconnected, they had control problems. Then, the plane did a nosedive. Well, let's review the data. Mm. Will the data recorder provide the answers they need to solve this case? Flight data recorders often add a, a level of detail that simply can't be gained from, from the witnesses themselves. And, and crucially, quite often the information that's gathered from a recording device uh, offers a slightly different perspective to what we might get from personal recollections. Stop. This is where the lightning struck at 2,000 feet. Right, and then for the next two and a half minutes, there's a slow, uneven climb to 4,000 feet. And then they are in a very steep nosedive, 20 seconds towards the North Sea. What were the pilots doing to recover from the dive? Look at the control column data. Right after the lightning struck, the crew pulled back on the control column to pitch the nose up. The FDR data confirms the pilots were tackling a control problem. But why? The captain said they were also applying pitch trim. Pitch trim moves the tail elevators up and down to maintain the pitch of the aircraft. Can we take a look at the pitch trim data, please? All right. Investigators make a puzzling discovery. Look at that. And the elevators are trying to get the nose to pitch down instead of up. After the lightning strike, some unknown force was fighting the pilot's inputs to both the control column and the pitch trim. The crew said the lightning struck, the autopilot disconnected, and then they had control problems. Right. Could we take a look at the autopilot data, please? Finally, the team zeroes in on the answer. The autopilot was on almost the entire time. Investigators discover that after the lightning strike, the pilots were in a tug of war with the plane. So we then had to look at why did the crew misunderstand the status of the aircraft? Executive Flight 1526 is flying a short 35-minute flight northeast from Dayton to Akron, Ohio. Zipline 1526, descend to 13,000. Zipline is Executive Flight's call sign. Descending to 13,000 feet. Thank you, Zipline 1526. I'm going to check the weather. Automated weather observation. Wind 290 zero at zero 07. Overcast 1800. Temperature 09 Celsius. All right. We have overcast weather. The crew prepares for possible bad weather in Akron. OK. Let's see. Akron. Right. Heading? 249. Flight 1526 continues its descent. Akron visibility, one and a half missed. Sky condition, overcast 600, broken. The crew learns the weather in Akron is getting worse. Temperature, one, one. Celsius. They need to know if it's still possible to land there. One and a half mile visibility. What visibility does this approach want? One and a quarter miles. 
All right, so we have visibility. Six minutes from Akron, the crew has a new distraction. A flight instructor is teaching a student pilot how to land in bad weather on the same runway assigned to Flight 1526. Flight 1526 is now four miles from the runway as it starts its final approach. Can you check if I've got everything? Ignition. Everything is all set. Stand by. Two and a half miles from the airport, the pilots are still searching for the runway. Finally, the plane breaks through the clouds. Ground. Keep going. OK, OK, level out now. I got it. Oh, up. No, 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 no! Ah! Executive Flight 1526 has crashed into a two-story residential building. Everyone on board is dead. Incredibly, none of the residents were home during the crash. The NTSB must now determine what caused this fatal accident. Executive Flight 1526 plunged into a residential neighborhood in Akron, Ohio. At the crash site, investigators combed through the wreckage for clues. We found the angle of attack indicator in the cockpit wreckage. That's important because at a certain angle of attack, the wing will stall. What angle were you at? It was damaged extensively, but they could see that the needle was in the red band. Investigators determined that the plane stalled as it approached the airport. Now they must understand why. Pull up. Pull up. It's great. Get that to Washington. The cockpit voice recorder from Executive Flight 1526 is recovered and sent to NTSB headquarters for analysis. The CVR is doubly important in this case, since the Hawker 700 wasn't equipped with a flight data recorder. While investigators wait for the voice recording, they work with what they have, the documents found in the cockpit wreckage. The weight and balance. Well, you look at that. We found that the weight and balance didn't account for the auxiliary power unit. It's a, uh, a little jet engine in the back that helps power the aircraft when it's on the ground. So. They had no APU. The team wonders how this compares to what they discovered at the crash site. Hello, APU. Looks like they were carrying more weight than they thought. Investigators believe they found an error in the plane's documented weight and balance. Were they too heavy? I wonder how much this plane truly weighed. The pilots made their calculations without accounting for an APU. But there clearly was one on board. The NTSB calculates the actual weight of the plane during its final flight. The APU weighs 300 pounds. And according to the aircraft refueler, they were loaded with 8,160 pounds of fuel, but they only rode down 7,700. So how much in total were they over by? Ah, they were only 286 pounds overweight. The plane's actual weight was slightly more than what the pilots recorded. really made a performance difference on the aircraft. 
The weight of the APU and the additional fuel was not enough to affect the balance of the airplane. But it did tell us that this crew and this company wasn't following their procedures appropriately. Somebody wasn't watching what they were supposed to be doing. Investigators need to look elsewhere to explain why Flight 1526 stalled. It's almost six in the morning in Lexington, Kentucky. The pilots of Com Air Flight 5191 prepare for their pre-flight briefing. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to take this time to welcome you on board Com Air Flight 5191 direct to Atlanta. We'll try to keep it as quiet as possible. Hopefully you can catch a nap on the way there. It's our pleasure having you on board today. There are 47 passengers and one flight attendant on today's flight. The pilots begin their briefing. Right flex takeoff procedures off of, he said what runway? 24? It's 22. Today they are bound for Atlanta, Georgia. Just a 67 minute flight straight south from Lexington's Bluegrass Airport. Lexington's air traffic controller clears flight 5191 to the runway. At your leisure, Com Air 121. Ready to go. Com Air 191. Lexington Tower. Fly runway heading. Clear for takeoff. Ugh. All yours, Jim. Captain Clay hands control of the aircraft to First Officer Polhenke for takeoff. My brakes, my controls. Set thrust, please. Thrust set. That is weird with no lights. Yeah. Under knots, checks. Something's not right. V1, rotate. As 5191 prepares to lift off. Whoa. Damn it! Air Flight 5191 hurtles into a field less than half a mile from the runway. This is Lexington, Alert 3, west side of the runway with a Com Air regional jet taking off. Forty-nine people are dead after the tragic takeoff of Com Air Flight 5191. First Officer Polhinky is the only survivor. The question NTSB investigators now need to answer is why Com Air Flight 5191 couldn't get off the ground. NTSB investigators begin looking for clues to discover why Com Air Flight 5191 crashed less than half a mile from Lexington's Bluegrass Airport. The wreckage path tells investigators that the plane was struggling to get off the ground. Was it engine trouble or something else? It looks like they took off from runway 26. But hang on. 26 wasn't in use last night. Lexington Airport has two runways, runway 26 and runway 22. According to the flight plan, they were supposed to take off from runway 22. 
So how the heck did they end up over here? Investigators are surprised to discover that Flight 5191 took off from the wrong runway. But being on the wrong runway doesn't explain why the plane barely made it off the ground. Let's take a closer look at those engines. Hey, they were spinning all right. Evidence of deformed blades suggests the engines were running on impact. Something else must have kept them from getting airborne. Maybe they were too heavy? With engine failure ruled out, the team wonders if the plane was loaded with too much weight to take off. Hmm. Oh, here it is. CRJ's max takeoff weight is 50,178 pounds. And the load manifested the plane weighed 49,000 87 pounds on that day. It's close, but it's within their limit. The aircraft wasn't too heavy to take off. In that aircraft on that day, with that weight, how much runway would be needed to take off safely? Using the actual weight of the aircraft and the CRJ-100 specifications, investigators calculate how much runway the plane needed to lift off. 3,744 feet. 3,744 feet, and runway 26 is? 3,501 feet. Investigators reach an astonishing conclusion. Runway 26 is 243 feet too short. They ran out of runway. They now understand why the plane couldn't get airborne. But they're still mystified. Why didn't Flight 5191 take off from the longer runway? It's just after 5 AM in Jakarta, Indonesia, as 181 passengers settle in for a short domestic flight. Lion Air Flight 610 is a 90-minute journey from Jakarta over the Java Sea to Bangka Island. At 6.20, Rotate. the MAX 8 lifts off the runway at Jakarta. But immediately, there's trouble. The captain's control yoke starts shaking a warning that the plane is about to stall. Take off config. OK, but what? The pilots can't identify the source of the problem. They have no choice but to continue climbing. Lion 610, fly heading 248. To follow standard instrument departure. Lion Air 610. The air traffic controller has no idea that there's an issue in the cockpit. The pilots get a warning that their airspeed indicators do not agree. Airspeed disagree. What's going on? Should we request a return to Jakarta? Landing gear up. Flight 610. Climb to flight level 270. Still unaware of any trouble, the controller instructs the crew to continue climbing to 27,000 feet. Altitude disagree. The first officer now notices that the altimeters also show conflicting readings. Acknowledged altitude disagree. The situation is deteriorating quickly. Now, flying 5,000 feet above the sea, Captain Sinesia struggles to keep the plane's nose up. Flight path vector may be unreliable. Line 610, turn right, heading 070 to avoid traffic ahead. Set the pitch attitude. 
Roger, heading 070. Flight 610 is flying erratically over the Java Sea and becoming increasingly more difficult to control. Controller allows Flight 610 to fly at any altitude the pilots choose. Uh, please clear 3,000 above and below of traffic. OK, we'll do. What altitude would you like? Uh, it's diving. It's diving. It's OK. It's OK. Flight 610 is now speeding towards the sea. Airspeed. And the pilots are out of options. Thirty minutes after crashing into the Java Sea, the wreckage of Lion Air Flight 610 is located. There are no survivors. It takes three days for search and rescue teams to lock onto the signal coming from the Max 8 Lion Air Flight 610's flight data recorder. Divers recover it from a depth of 115 feet. The recorder has preserved data from the accident flight and 18 previous flights, covering almost 1,800 different parameters. Master caution goes off as soon as they leave the ground, probably because airspeed and altitude don't agree. Stick shaker activates here. The data shows a repeat of the problem on the previous flight. Faulty readings caused by a discrepancy between the left and right angle of attack sensors. From the FDR data we received, we learned that this plane had faulty angle of attack readings that affected both flights similarly. Left and right angle of attack values change with altitude. Are off by 21 degrees for the entire flight. We suspected the new angle of attack sensor installed in Bali was either faulty or the installation process was done incorrectly. On the MAX 8, the angle of attack sensor doesn't just measure the airplane's angle. Altitude disagree. It helps calculate precise airspeed and altitude. That explains why airspeed and altitude disagreed throughout the whole flight. The malfunctioning sensor on the captain's side resulted in a difference between the left and right side speed and altitude displays. Then there's this. The data clearly shows that for every nose up trim input, there is a corresponding automatic nose down trim input. NTSB. The NTSB brought a representative from Boeing to help us in our investigation. We're trying to understand these automatic inputs. Looks like the MCAS kicked in. What's that? Boeing points to an obscure automated system known as MCAS, the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System. It only kicks in when these three conditions are met. Boeing explains that MCAS only activates when it senses that the angle of attack is excessive, when the autopilot is off, and when the flaps are retracted, an extremely rare combination. Tragically, the data shows that because of the faulty maintenance on the angle of attack sensor, Flight 610 ended up meeting all three conditions. The series of problems occurred when the left angle of attack sensor was replaced in Bali. Investigators dig deeper into the data and discover the MCAS system had no failsafe. The MCAS installed in the plane relied on only one sensor. MCAS only took data from one angle of attack sensor, not both. Most protection systems are designed with redundancy, so a single failure doesn't result in catastrophe. Southwest Airlines Flight 1380 is boarding for a trip to Dallas, Texas. The crew flew in earlier today from Nashville. 
The four-hour trip to Dallas will be their second and final flight of the day. As Flight 1380 climbs to cruising altitude, controllers at LaGuardia hand the flight over to New York area controllers. Southwest 1380, contact New York Center. 133.47. Copy that, 1380. 20 minutes after takeoff. Thank you. Everything changed. What the? Oh, oh. We had a very large bang. We had multiple warnings going off in the cockpit and a very severe vibration throughout the entire plane. First Officer Elliser struggles to control the aircraft as it banks steeply to the left. I immediately grabbed the yoke to stop the roll. You still got it! I was not able to see any of the engine instruments because the vibration was so severe, it was just a blur of colors. And so I can't see anything. Still got it. Luckily, it was, a, it was a clear day, a very clear horizon, and I was able to roll out of the bank and recover the airplane. First Officer Ellisor reduces engine power and begins a steep descent. Flight 1380 is 10 minutes away from Philadelphia International Airport and closing fast. At an altitude of just 1,000 feet and three miles from Philadelphia International Airport, the pilots prepare for an emergency landing. Southwest 1380, runway 27 left, cleared to land. 27 left, cleared to land, Southwest 1380. It's seconds before touchdown. Flight 1380 is flying towards the runway at breakneck speed. Speed break. Armed with a green light. The pilots are unsure of the damage to the plane. They're making a high speed approach with a reverse thrust from only one engine to slow them down. They might not have enough runway to stop safely. 50 feet, 30 feet. Captain Schultz is a veteran Navy pilot. She's landed F-18 Hornets in war zones, but this is a landing unlike any other. Speed breaks up. The thrust reverser on their only engine deploys. If the reverser doesn't work, the plane could overshoot the runway. We touch down. Uh, it was a great landing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to pull her around here to the fire trucks. Flight 1380 rolls to a stop. Investigators study the inspection history for the fan blades in the left engine of Flight 1380. They did a full overhaul in 2012. Let me see. They learned that all the fan blades, including fan blade 13, were inspected during a major overhaul in 2012, six years before the incident on Southwest 1380. During the overhaul, the protective coating on each of the blades is stripped. Then a fluorescent dye is used to help identify any fatigue cracking. Investigators review the work orders done on the fan blades during the 2012 overhaul. Hmm. This checks out. It says they did a full inspection of blade 13. Investigators determined that at the time of the 2012 overhaul, all the fan blades were found to be in good condition. But how were the fan blades maintained by Southwest Airlines after the overhaul? They're supposed to be lubricated and visually inspected between 1,500 and 3,000 flights. There's seven more routine checks here. They're all comprehensive, all done on time. 
this was the appropriate and approved maintenance process that uh, all technicians used at that time. If Fan Blade 13 was checked routinely for six years and passed all its inspections, investigators wonder when the crack began. So what do you got? Have a look. A microscopic examination of the fracture surface might tell them more about when the metal fatigue started. I see. The crack was growing. Using high magnifications, investigators can see tiny tracings called striations. There's thousands of them. Investigators tally the striations on the fractured blade. That means counting tens of thousands of microscopic marks on a tiny piece of metal. There's over 32,000 striations. What's that tell you? By counting the striations on the base of fan blade number 13, investigators are able to date the beginnings of the crack. Well, this crack could have started more than six years ago. It's an important development. The fatigue crack on fan blade 13 likely began before the engine overhaul in 2012, when the blades were under close inspection. The pressure on investigators mounts. There are more than 4,000 Boeing 737s in service using the same type of fan blades. The same inspection regime that missed the growing crack is also used throughout the aviation industry. The catastrophe that struck Flight 1380 could happen again. U.S. Bangla Flight 211 cruises above the Himalayas. Their destination is Kathmandu Airport in Nepal. It's a 90-minute flight from Dhaka to Kathmandu. The crew is flying a Bombardier Dash 8 Q400. BS211 tower, wind 8 knots, runway 02, continue approach. BS-211 is on final approach to runway 02. Tribhuvan International Airport has one 10,000-foot airstrip. Planes approaching the airport from the south land on runway 02, and from the north on runway 20. But BS-211 isn't ready to land. Have you seen the runway? BS-211 has overflown the entire runway and is now headed north toward the mountains. I think we're going to runway 02. Concerned by what he's seeing, the supervising controller steps in to assist flight 211. OK, Bangle Star 211, runway 20, clear to land. Kathmandu Air Traffic Control redirects BS-211 to turn left and land on runway 20. But the plane isn't lining up with the runway. Bangla Star 211, turn right. You have the runway to land. Confirm you have the runway in sight. Negative. Where is the runway? Sir, runway. Runway 3 o'clock. Affirmative. We have runway in sight. Request clear to land, sir. BS-211, clear to land. He's lining up for the taxiway. BS-211, that is not the runway. Over, that's not the runway. BS-211, that is not the runway. I say again. The pilots make a last-minute adjustment to try to line up their plane with a runway. But the airplane is headed directly for the control tower instead. 
The pilots of U.S. Bangla 211 struggled desperately to get their planes safely on the ground. U.S. Bangla 211 bursts into flames 440 meters from the runway. 49 people are dead. A multinational commission is formed to investigate the tragedy. It consists of delegates from Nepal, Bangladesh, and Canada representing the Canadian manufacturer of the Dash 8 Bombardier. BS-211's flight data recorder is ready for analysis. Will it reveal if the pilots were in control of their aircraft? These are the inputs the captain made to the control column. And these are the actual movements of the flight controls. Investigators compare the captain's inputs to the actual movements of the plane's flight controls. They make an important discovery. They're identical. The plane was doing everything the captain commanded to do. Let's see you later on the flight. Take a look at these inputs. They're so extreme. Bank angle, bank angle. Sink rate. The data shows Captain Sultan was making some severe inputs to his control column near the end of the flight. Bank angle, bank angle. If there wasn't a flight control problem, why was the captain flying the plane so erratically? This is the flight path the plane was supposed to take. To better understand exactly what the plane was doing as it approached the airport, investigators compile the heading data and chart the exact course of the plane. And this is the flight path they actually took. What the data shows is astonishing. Looks like they drifted way off course. And flew loops very close to the mountains. Looks like the trouble started right here. 17 miles out when they arrived at Guras Waypoint. Pilots navigate by following a series of waypoints or GPS locations along their flight path. Guras is the last waypoint into Kathmandu Airport. Investigators dig deeper into the FDR data to understand why BS-211 drifted off course at Guras. They programmed the flight management system for a holding pattern over Guras. Here. The FDR data reveals that the crew pre-programmed a holding pattern about 34 miles before reaching Guras. And when they reach Guras, it looks like they start their holding pattern. Right here. But the heading data shows the crew didn't complete their holding pattern. The question is, why? It's late afternoon at King Abdulaziz Airport in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Dozens of U.S. Air Force KC-135 aircraft prepare for late night missions during the Gulf War. Major Kevin Sweeney and the crew of U.S. Air Force Flight Whale 05 review the final details of their mission. Start switches. He's the commander. Flight start. Sweeney has over 20 years of Air Force flying experience. It's his job to know the mission and his plane. But the aircraft commander is just like the captain. You haven't made any tough decisions. It's your responsibility, although you, it's very important to take input from the rest of your crew members and listen to them. At 5.25 p.m., Wheel 05 lifts off from Jeddah. Tonight's mission takes them along a tanker corridor. 
an aerial highway for tanker crews heading north from Jeddah. When they reach Waypoint Rita, they'll turn east before making their final turn to the rendezvous point less than 180 miles from combat zones near the Kuwaiti border. Whale 05 reaches cruising altitude. As they get closer to enemy territory, the pilots reduce radio contact to avoid detection. Moments later, what the? things go very wrong. I got it. It takes just a second for the plane to roll 110 degrees to the left. The crew can't tell if there's some kind of malfunction or if they're under attack. We're gonna lose her. See, we gotta get her level. Just as it seems the plane is in an unrecoverable left bank, it snaps hard to the right. Just when all seems lost, Major Sweeney plays a hunch. Speed brake! Speed brakes are devices on airplane wings designed to increase drag during descent and landing. Sweeney deploys the speed brakes on both wings, hoping it will level the airplane. It's a procedure Sweeney remembers from his training. It works. Incredibly, the pilots have managed to level the plane. But they're not out of trouble yet. All right, I have lateral control, but we're losing altitude. We've got fire lights on engines one and two. The pilots discover a problem with the two left engines. Steve, how bad are the fires on engines one and two? Checking. If there's a fire in the engines, it could lead to disaster. Oh my God. The only thing I could see was torn sheet metal on the wing where the engines were and fuel being vented over the top of the wing. They're not on fire. They're gone. No fire? Affirmative. No fire. The engines are gone. Roger. U.S. Air Force investigator Ike Stokes tries to understand how wake turbulence nearly destroyed a gigantic tanker aircraft. Separation between the two planes by the book. That's it. The wind was 85 knots from the west. The wind was blowing enough at altitude to push the wingtip vortices from the preceding airplane into the flight path of the mishap aircraft. I mean, they accounted for everything. They were foiled by the direction of the wind. Perfect storm. But Stokes still doesn't know how this perfect storm ever got a chance to form. When you're taking off between 90 to 100 airplanes, on a daily basis, the arrival and departure from the base is very critical. And in this particular case, the mishap aircraft was parked in such a way that it had to go first and be followed by the second airplane, the one that had further to go. The solution that they came up with was a perfectly responsible solution, and that was we're going to take off individually, and then you're going to pass me had the number two plane been parked to the left of the mishap airplane, the mishap never would have occurred. Investigators finally understand what happened to Whale 05. 05's level. On a wartime mission over the Saudi Arabian desert, two KC-135s switch position mid-flight. Altitude hold on. Altitude hold check. The wake turbulence generated by the passing plane is blown into the path of Whale 05. It creates a tremendous force that flips the plane so violently, G-forces rip both engines off the left wing. 
I've often heard flying described as hours and hours of sheer boredom, followed by moments of stark raving terror. In this case, the crew experienced that stark raving terror. Now there's too much stress. The oscillations almost push the right engines and the aircraft beyond the point of recovery. Speed brake. But with the quick thinking of a seasoned wartime commander, the plane levels off. Coming back to level flight was a true feat of airmanship. Greg, are your nav instruments working? Yes, INS is functional, radar is still up. Well, give me a heading back to Jeddah. The coordination of a well-trained crew. Nose gear down and locked. Runway in sight. Brings Whale 05 back home safely. Aircraft commander was an excellent airman. But the fact is, he had every brain in that airplane working in tandem with him, side by side, to make sure they didn't miss anything. Brakes! I was very fortunate to fly one of the best crews in the Air Force, in my humble opinion. They did their job in a critical situation. And it wasn't just me getting back to the airplane. It was the team got back to the airplane. We did it. Whether it's a refueling plane in wartime. We did it. Or a routine domestic flight in a 747. The importance of teamwork can never be overstated. It's nine in the morning as ANSAT New Zealand Flight 703 cruises toward the city of Palmerston North, New Zealand. William McGrory is flying to his company's head office for an early morning meeting. I was working for a plumbing company. I was based in Auckland, and they were based in Palmerston North. As we were on approach... I don't think their landing gear's down on the right side. Can you check your window? No, I can't see the landing gear at all. In the cockpit, Captain Southern and his first officer are already troubleshooting the problem. As Flight 703 nears Palmerston North, the pilots follow the procedure for lowering landing gear manually. Airspeed below 140 knots? It's 140. Karen was sitting right there in front of me, and the next minute... And then I'll have a few days off, so I'll probably head down to... Another crash, and then we seem to be sliding. Eventually, we came to a stop. I guess it just flicked into survival mode and didn't really matter what was wrong with me. It just, I was alive. Get out of this plane, that was probably the only single thing that was on my mind at the time. Saw a hole in front of me on the right-hand side, and saw that as an opportunity to get out. In the airport's tower, controller Tony Chapman tries to contact ANSAT Flight 703. I don't know where they are. There's no signals at all, and they're off radar. We're out in front of the nose now, which was facing back the way we came. I saw my little briefcase, so I grabbed that and opened it up, knowing full well that my phone was in there. They rang 111, and they said, what emergency do you need, uh, ambulance, fire, or police? And I said, send the whole bloody lot. We've got a plane crash, send everything. And she immediately changed her tone and, and said, just hang up and we'll get back to you. Did he say where they were? OK, did you get a number? The operator has notified Palmerston North's tower of McGrory's call. Perfect. Thank you. Hello? William, whatever happens, do not hang up the phone. You have to stay on the phone with me. Can you see if you can find some kind of landmark, anything that can help find where we are? The passenger who had come to help me said, uh, I'll, I'll have a look around. So he went off up the hill. And he'd gone quite a distance in quite a while, really. And he came back some time later, and he said, there's a big holding pen for sheep up the hill further. We're next to a, a very large sheep holding pen. Looks like they're near the Buckley Stockyard up by Hallblock Road. With the location of the crash roughly pinpointed, 
rescuers make their way to the scene. Flight 703 has crashed into a hill 10 miles from the airport at Palmerston North. 15 passengers and both pilots have survived. Tragically, three passengers and flight attendant Karen Gallagher are killed. We were very, very lucky that 17 of us survived. I think so sadly for those that did lose their lives, the hostess and the others that died on that day was um, so unnecessary. Investigators need to examine the wreckage of ANSAT 703 to determine why the pilots were unable to get their landing gear down. But the muddy terrain is presenting a challenge. It was uh, virtually impossible to get equipment onto that site. It would just slip and they would get stuck and slide down hills and so on. Vance comes up with a solution. They had a huge helicopter owned by Russians. What we suggested to them that they do is get a big long cable and put the cable through the fuselage. The ribs were in good enough condition that they would basically hold the weight of that fuselage. With all the wreckage in a hangar, investigators are able to examine the right landing gear to understand why it didn't come down. Vance is joined by Jim Donnelly, a maintenance engineer from de Havilland, the Dash 8's manufacturer. When the landing gear is up, a latch holds a roller on the gear's leg in the retracted position. When pilots lower the gear, an actuator moves the uplock latch to release the roller, allowing the landing gear to extend. This is probably where the problem was. latch is definitely showing signs of wear. Over time, the roller wore a small groove into the right side latch. It was enough to prevent it from sliding into the down position. Here's another. Landing gear fails to extend. Yeah. It definitely was an issue. Investigators dig through the Dash 8's history. Uh, the inset fleet sure had its share of problems. And both are Dash 8's by the looks of it. Anset New Zealand's Dash 8's had been experiencing landing gear failures for years. Just the left side. Gotcha. Thanks for that. They replaced the mechanism on the left side but we're waiting on parts for the right. ANSET only replaced the uh, left up lock actuator because that is where they experienced the majority of their issues. But all of these gear problems were easily dealt with. In every case, the pilots used the alternate method to lower the gear. And they all landed safely. If the gear didn't lower normally, pilots could pull a handle in the cockpit that manually disengaged the latch so that the gear could drop into position. The alternate system is 100% reliable. There has never been an issue with the alternate landing gear extension system failing to lower a landing gear. But evidence from the cockpit wreckage reveals the first officer didn't pull the handle hard enough to release the landing gear. We saw that the handle that is normally pulled uh, was partially pulled. Failing to lower the landing gear is unusual, but it doesn't explain why the pilots of ANSET Flight 703 slammed into a hill just a few miles from the airport. It's the first flight of the day for the crew of Prop Air Flight 420. Today's flight is a 90-minute hop from Dorval to Peterborough, Ontario. The plane has been in the air for 12 minutes. A what? What is it? Looks like we lost hydraulics. 
doorbell approach. This is Prop 420. We've had dual hydraulic failure. Request clearance to return to Dorval. The Metroliner has two hydraulic systems. One controls the flaps, the other the landing gear. Looks like we're landing without flaps. With no flaps, the pilots can't reduce their speed without stalling. Then, just 30 seconds after losing hydraulics, before they've started back to the airport. What's going on? He wants to roll left. Really? I'm holding it right. Something's wrong with the controls. Need to trim half turn to the right. If the plane is rolling in one direction, applying trim avoids the need for continuous pilot inputs. Trimming it right brings the left wing up and levels the plane. As Flight 420 gets halfway back to Dorval. Fire. The left engine's on fire. An even bigger problem emerges. Left engine shutdown procedure. The pilots attempt to extinguish the fire in the left engine. Left power lever. Confirmed left. The captain executes the engine shutdown procedure. Back to idle. Confirmed left shutoff lever. Confirmed. Pulling left engine stop lever. Dorval approach, prop air 420. Left engine is on fire. We've shut it down. I see you are returning to Dorval. I can give you direct to Mirabel. Affirmative. Direct to Mirabel. While Flight 420 is only 11 minutes from Dorval, they reroute to Montreal's other airport, Mirabel, which is closer. I see flames now. Flames from the engine nozzle. The situation goes from bad to dire. Fire crews park alongside the runway at Mirabel Airport for the emergency landing of Flight 420. Captain Provencher is struggling to maintain control. Now he has to lower the landing gear manually with no guarantee it will work. Gear down now! Gear down! The nose and right wheels have dropped, but one light stays off. Prop Air 420 is 20 seconds from touchdown. Rolling left! Not now! They're just five seconds from being able to touch down when disaster strikes. The plane crashes into a watery ditch next to the runway. Despite the best efforts of rescue crews, no one makes it out of the plane alive. What? What is it? Looks like we lost hydraulics. Investigators now turn to the cockpit voice recorder of Prop Air 420 to determine why firefighters and the pilots both reported an engine fire. I've got the column halfway to the right. I can't believe it's taken this much trim to hold it straight. Hang on. Control problems just 30 seconds after hydraulic failure. The okay, Dorval is here. Now they're barely out of the gate for the hydraulics fail here. They haven't even begun their turn, and the controls start acting up here. Fire. The left engine's on fire. Is that a passenger? Fire in the left engine? The passenger report of an engine fire confuses the crew. The engine overheat warning is off. Left engine shutdown procedure. The captain follows the checklist, but it doesn't solve the problem. I see flames now. Flames from the engine nozzle. I don't have the fire light. The cockpit voice recording provides investigators with their biggest lead yet. Maybe the fire started in the wheel well. That's so close to the engine, the crew could have made that mistake. 
the team discovers that pieces of the left landing gear are burned almost beyond recognition. The team finds that several components of the left side brake show significant heat damage. Piston housings are melted. Cylinders are blackened. Investigators can finally confirm that an in-flight fire aboard Prop Air 420 began in the left wheel well, but they still don't know what started it. This is the left brake disc, correct? One component is key. Thing got pretty hot somehow. The grayish-blue color stands out. The landing gear would need a fuel source to ignite. But the wheel well is nowhere near the heavily reinforced tanks. Investigators focus on the tubing inside the left wheel well, called the nacelle. The hydraulic line there. Door valve approach. This is Prop 420. We've had dual hydraulic failure. Request clearance to return to door valve. The melted lines would cause the hydraulics to fail, the first problem reported by the crew. So the heat from the brakes melts the line. Hydraulic fluid pours out everywhere. There's your fire, right there. It's a good theory, but they need evidence to back it up. Investigators design a test to determine if hydraulic fluid could ignite when exposed to overheated brakes. They heat the disc to 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature that would have been needed to give the left brake discs their grayish blue color. It's an early summer morning when UPS Flight 1354 climbs over Kentucky. Tonight's flight from Louisville, Kentucky to Birmingham, Alabama takes about an hour. The crew is flying the newest version of the Airbus A300, equipped with advanced computers and flight management systems to assist pilots. The runway they were expecting is closed for maintenance. They'll have to use an alternate. The alternate runway is shorter. With the plane nearly at maximum weight, they'll have to carefully manage their speed and altitude on approach. Landing on runway 18 also involves a more demanding approach, known as a non-precision approach. In a non-precision approach, Pilots pre-program the flight computer to follow a virtual glide path or descent profile to the runway threshold. Five miles from the runway, the captain realizes something's not right. Unbelievable. Too high. The autopilot hasn't initiated its final descent to the airport. The captain tries to get the plane back on its programmed glide path. If the plane remains too high this close to the runway, the crew could overshoot it. Autopilot's off. The captain prepares to fly the plane manually to touchdown. As they get closer to the airport... Did I hit something? Oh, no! Oh, God! The pilots can't control the plane as it cuts through a small grove. No! Oh my god! UPS Flight 1354 crashes just one mile short of the runway. Yes, yes. 
Airport 12, there's been a crash. UPS 1354 heavy crash on the hill. Attention, aircraft crash, three miles final runway 18. Rescue crews rush to extinguish the flames of UPS Flight 1354. Despite the plane coming down in a populated area and crossing a highway in Birmingham, Alabama, no one on the ground is injured. Tragically, both pilots are killed. Within hours, the National Transportation Safety Board begins the investigation. Verify the glide path agrees with the approach chart within one degree. Did a malfunction in the flight computer used to program the autopilot lead to the crash of UPS Flight 1354? Verify approach, point one degrees. The flight management system to an airline pilot in an airline operation like this is very critical because it is the automation. It is the typical way of flying a large aircraft. If you have bad data in, that data will cause bad things to happen. OK. Let's hook this up. Investigators recover the flight computer's memory card from the wreckage. They prepare to test it for signs of errors or malfunctions. The investigators went to great pains to figure out what exactly was loaded into the flight management computer. It was damaged, so they had to remove the motherboard and place it in a functioning unit and, and actually read it out. They should tell us if the computer was working. If the flight computer was operational, investigators should be able to download its memory. It's working. Turned out that there was nothing wrong with the flight management computer. But had there been, that could have been a very important part of the accident sequence. The computer was working. Looks like they programmed it. Final approach is armed for a gradual descent of three degrees. Wait a minute. They've got two separate destinations programmed. They forgot to clear the conflict. They discovered the crew missed a step in planning their route to Birmingham Airport. They failed to clear a previously programmed destination. It's a troubling find. You can load a flight plan into it, and then if you deviate from that particular flight plan, the flight management computer doesn't really know what's going on and can put out false data, and that's called a discontinuity. The crew programmed the plane to fly directly to Birmingham Airport. 20 miles out, they needed to clear their flight path and program a specific approach to runway 18. But the crew didn't clear the initial plan, which created the discontinuity, a confusion in the system. So there was a conflict between where the pilots told the airplane to start the approach and where the computer knew the approach had to start, and that was a flight plan discontinuity. That's why the autopilot wouldn't initiate the descent path. The captain basically was chasing the incorrect guidance that the display was telling him by trying to descend as quickly as he could when there was no reason for it. The team knows the crew didn't clear the conflict. The question is why. <laughs> 